Hi, everyone. Uh, Gene, Stephanie, Tim. It's uh, great to be with you. Uh, we are on the crypto stage. And obviously, you can't talk about crypto without decentralized finance. You know, we've been talking about DeFi now for since at least the summer of 2020, right? The infamous DeFi summer. But sometimes we use terms that describe things that aren't actually in reality. Is DeFi truly decentralized? I want to kick off with that question. And maybe we'll start with, with Gene on the side. So um, the current model people think about is the Ethereum model. And the way Ethereum kind of works is these centralized monolithic smart contracts. Now, those could be decentralized, but there's been all sorts of incentives, both for security reasons, upgrade, and monetization. that people haven't necessarily decentralized the things they're calling DeFi. However, like on Bitcoin or on Chia, which uses the coin model, it's inherently decentralized, and so you can actually do peer-to-peer -peer DeFi. And that makes it a lot more trustworthy, but it then requires you to do things like actually self-custody. Can I add, I would say DeFi isn't a legal term or a technical term. There's no precise definition. There are degrees of decentralization. And with any platform or protocol, there's probably some degree of control by a person, a group of people, or an entity over governance, over maintenance of the code, over marketing, sales, and promotion. But it's still important. And what's important about it, to me, is really it combines a couple things. One is tokenization of assets, programmability, or the potential for programmability through smart contracts, and then some degree of decentralization. But that's going to vary, and there's not, never going to be sort of a fully decentralized thing, and that also gets into regulation, but we'll get to that. Mm. <laughs> I mean, the only thing that I would add is that the line between CFI and DeFi is going to be more and more blurry mm -hmm. as we start to talk about, which I think is the point of this panel, regulation in the industry, because exactly what are you regulating in the DeFi world, I think is part of what is really at stake. Mm -hmm. So I think that's kind of the point of what we're getting into. Yeah, in this well, we're, we're going to get into regulation in a bit. Lots of talk about regulation. But before I, I ask that, do you see any particular use cases in DeFi that are actually interesting, that are actually DeFi? Or is it one of those things where we're creating a problem and looking for a solution? Do you have any ideas of what kind of actual use cases DeFi has? And maybe you can explain what they are and how they operate? Gene? Look, Uniswap-style AMMs that are implemented correctly are truly decentralized. And, you know, I, I differ with uh, the former CFTC individual here just a little that if two individuals can download software from GitHub independently of anyone else, and use that to transact peer-to-peer, -peer, that's pretty DeFi. Mm -hmm. Because the argument that there's always a centralized entity would pull in paying cash for Beanie Babies in McDonald's parking lots, right? Cash is pretty decentralized. I think we think that using cash is DeFi. And so there are absolutely applications that can be this way. Uh, things like Tornado Cash, you know, the developers there did the right things mm -hmm. to truly lose control of that contract in a way that they cannot control it. And I think we're gonna see the courts go explain that you know, FBI versus Apple is the core issue here, and if you're a software publisher, you have First Amendment rights to publish your software. Even if it might otherwise uh, walk into regulatory waters, you can't force software developers shipping pure software to change their software to fit your regulatory environment. Well, I would just say, I, I don't disagree with Gene's example of the two people, but if something's gonna become significant, it's gonna involve a lot more than two people. And the point is that if it really does become significant, you're not going to be able to argue that it's immune from regulation on the basis that it's decentralized. There will be some point of attachment. But to your question about, you know, applications, I mean, we're still at a very early stage. But I think you could see just platforms that allow people to trade that are more accessible that bring liquidity to asset classes that maybe don't have it. Um, you know, I don't think we're going to see peer-to-peer -peer lending and borrowing so much because those things end up, people say they're doing that, but then it ends up getting pooled more than that. But again, we're still at an early stage, and what we need to be moving toward is allowing this kind of innovation to happen, but also recognizing that if you're offering a financial product, if you're offering a financial service, that's going to have to be regulated consistently with how we would do that if it were a centralized institution. But let's make sure the regulations don't just favor the centralized institutions. You want to add something, Gene? Yeah, so 
there's a place where I disagree, which is a lot of the regulations historically have come out of the fact that humans are horrible to humans. And so the moment you have someone else have custody of your money or the ability to take that custody, that's the real problem. And in fact, to date, blockchains have been horrible at self-custody. You know, the idea that you would keep 24 words around that can also steal all of your funds is a bad idea. So today we're announcing that we're going to support Apple Secure Elements, Android phones, any hardware security element out there, so that instead of having one key, you have two or three keys. And so when you lose your iPhone, you use your backup iPad to replace that iPhone. That's the way that you get the self-custody. So when we talk about having the same regulatory environment, if you've got a centralized exchange or you've got, for example, a lending pool where people are making decisions, yeah, we're in the same regulatory environment. But in the AMM, for example, it's a robot. It is absolutely bound by math. You can have 10,000 users all trading in that, and they all have actual total self-custody, and the only transaction that can happen is the one that they have expressed they're willing to make. Very different regulatory landscape when you're talking about that. It, it's different, but we've got to achieve the same objective. Correct. So we've got to make sure that platform meets the standards that we would require of a centralized entity. And to the extent, again, you know, there's some group of people maintaining and improving the code or doing something, that's probably going to be a point of attachment. Well, the problem with that conversation is then Linux and Windows are a point of <laughs> attachment for trading, right? The but they're not offering... Not very bright there. Yeah, but they're not offering a particular financial transaction or product. Yeah, but the idea that the rails upon which a financial transaction product run like email and text are somehow part of the uh, protocol, it's a difficult call. Like Tornado Cash, great example. There is no ongoing development for Tornado Cash. It's done, right? Is that regulatorily the same as something where something's ongoing? I don't think so. I'm not saying there aren't challenges. I'm just saying ultimately regulation will catch up in some way. And we're not going to, you know, it's not, things aren't going to be immune from regulation on the basis that they're decentralized. The thing that's changed <laughs> is that the uh, securities laws and the commodities laws have never really dealt with the First Amendment. And with so, what? With the First Amendment. Um, and that's very, very different. Like, the problem is the technology quickly gets to, you're telling a software developer what software he can write, and that becomes problematic very quickly. Well, you know, there was a recent court case that maybe sheds a little bit of light as to how the courts might think about this, which involved a DAO. It's called the Uki DAO case, where there was a platform that was basically spun off uh, by its developers so that only the token holders had, you know, some ability to participate and govern. And it was trading, it was essentially engaged in, in derivatives transactions that otherwise had to be registered with the CFTC. And the court said, yeah, we don't care that it's this DAO. Uh, we're going to view it as an unincorporated association and hold it liable. And it did. The platform then folded because uh, people didn't want to deal with that. So, you know, I yeah, think but, regulation will catch up. I think it should be different because we want to encourage this kind of innovation. And really, to me, that's what the DeFi enthusiasts have to kind of embrace. They shouldn't be kind of arguing, oh, we're immune from regulation because we're decentralized and we're global and we don't really interact with any particular nation's laws, they should be saying, yes, we understand the objectives of regulation. Let's figure out a way to meet them. And I think, Gene, from what I've heard about your, yeah. what you're doing, you're trying to do that. Yeah, I was going to say, I think we actually agree about one thing, which is that the current regulatory environment isn't that difficult, actually. <laughs> so when you actually look at what the laws actually mean and you're not trying to circumvent them, it's actually not hard to build regulatory compliant assets and DAPs and these other things, but, you know, often people are trying to use a DAO to get a group of people together and avoid regulation about having a group of people. That isn't the way you want to go about it. You should use DAO-style technologies, but have like a Delaware LLC that actually is potentially regulable, yeah. right? That's, that's where I think we do agree is that, it, in fact, where the regulation is about, for example, custody or third-party capabilities, that's still going to be applicable. Yeah. But there is a class, and it's rare, and that's yeah. sad, but there's yeah. a class of these technologies that are outside of the 40 Act or, you know, these other things, so. So, so Gene, uh, from, from your perspective, Stephanie, go ahead. No, I was just going to ask, then, like, where do you put the line on, there's been a bunch of actors, specifically in the U.S., since we're talking about the U.S., like Coinbase, that have tried specifically to register for years and have been unable to. So I actually 
kind of like we were talking about this beforehand, but completely disagree with the notion that we're the the SEC rules and what they have set forth via enforcement have been clear. I actually feel like many of my projects feel like the rules have been changed from under them multiple times that have made it extremely difficult to operate in the U.S. regulatory environment today. So I'm curious where you where where you land on that because I actually don't believe that it's been it's been crystal clear what's legal and what's not and how to follow a legal path in the framework of where we are. So look, when we're talking about securities laws, even Travis Kalnick at Uber could follow the securities laws. This is not <laughs> actually that difficult. The idea that selling coins for an investment of money somehow made them not a security has been a original sin. And so you've got these projects who did that. I have some sympathy for the projects because I believe it was the investors who wanted to do that because they did not want to wait for a registration statement. There were other paths. You can, for example, not sell coins and instead sell equity. And by the way, everyone outside of crypto does those sorts of things instead. So I think that when you hear the I don't know what's going on and saying I did an illegal securities <laughs> offering and don't really want to talk about it. But way beyond securities law, I think there's a whole bunch of other regulatory frameworks that need to be potentially updated around payments, around stable coins, there's a, around the software debate that you guys were just having, there's a whole bunch of other things that end up being, that have no clear home today. And I think that's where I have found the most, or the projects in my portfolio have found the most difficulty. It's well, not really with this idea of like, an illegal ICO, everybody knows what an illegal ICO looks like, but it's everything else on the margins that's being impacted. Look, there are some challenges. I, I agree that ultimately we're going to have to sort of customize some things. But the real challenge when you're a regulator is that this is evolving so quickly and where it's going is still somewhat unclear that you can't really, it's very difficult to say I'm going to create this special kit set of rules for anything digital. Because then you're going to have people sort of digitizing or tokenizing other assets as a way to escape and avoid the rules that have been in place for a long time. So that's the hard part. Um, it'll take us time to get there. Though I will say, you know, when you're talking about things like banking access and the travel rule and where KYC should and shouldn't apply, you know, lost in a lot of, and not your sort of regulatory environment, but other regulatory environment is the US dollar does everything they say you shouldn't do with a cryptocurrency. And in fact, it is the dominant currency around the world because it is privacy protecting in places like Venezuela. And we're going to have to be able to continue to ape those kinds of opportunities because in the United States, the Fourth Amendment that means that you can't kind of circumvent it. So there are some real challenges where you've got um, certain assumptions that everything should be KYC or certain assumptions that anonymity or privacy is bad. It is the exact opposite. And I mean, I'll give you a great example. Uh, we have the ability to do like stage three drug trials on chain. But of course, the underlying data must absolutely be private because right. you can't do a stage three drug trial in public. Uh, and I've seen some regulators look at that and go, how dare you have privacy features? And it's like, do you understand HIPAA? <laughs> well, yeah. And that's where, you know, we have to sort of focus on what are the objectives of the regulation? How is this new technology trying to achieve those objectives? And what risk, you know, what are the risks that it's creating that we need to address? Well, um, and to your point, even on the securities laws, you know, we've chosen to take the path of cooperate with the SEC, ultimately register equity and have our coins be backed, backing the equity as well as our business. That's hard. You know, only people like Bram and I who've been, you know, I'm an ex-public company CEO can pull that off easily and spend the millions of dollars and get the big four audit. You know, we did this thing called the Jobs Act to try to make some of this stuff easier. And I think either what we're already seeing from uh, Immer or potentially even what we did with the Jobs Act to make taking these things public and going through the registration process more like it was in 1990 than what it is today in 2020. Yeah, yeah. So, oh, go, ahead. You wanna, no, go ahead. Well, I want to kind of go back and, I mean, Tim, you might be in a position to answer this, but a few years ago, the SEC came out with, or at least commented on Bitcoin and Ethereum being quote unquote sufficiently decentralized. Uh, what exactly does that mean? And are you seeing a similar trend to sufficient decentralization in current projects, or do they differ markedly from those two examples? So wh what the SEC was really getting at was the basis on which you would say those are not securities. Mm -hmm. And the essence of the definition of a security is when you invest in something where you expect its value to improve 
as a result of the managerial efforts of others. That's kind of the key phrase. It relates back to, a, to an old court case, but it has served us well as a definition. And so when you think about Bitcoin and you think about Ethereum, you know, people invest in those, and particularly with Bitcoin, because I think it's very clear with Bitcoin, um, their value really just depends on what the market thinks the value is. There's not a group of people that's kind of managing it or even managing the code really, you know, in terms of controlling it. Um, and so that's what they were saying. With the other tokens, you know, 20,000 other tokens, mm -hmm. eh, probably a lot of them are securities. Um, but, you know, where we need to, to go with this is figuring out a way to have some reasonable rules and, and reasonable disclosure so that you can even figure out which ones kind of really do fall into the securities bucket. You know, it's very hard to say today because you don't know, are the developers still controlling this? Are they still involved? You know, does some other group have control over it? Um, because those are kind of the, the hallmarks of, of a security. No. And uh, Gene, I mean, based on what you said earlier, it seems like for you, securities laws are pretty clear. So you wouldn't be surprised with the, what some are calling reg regulation by enforcement that we're seeing in 2023. Are you surprised by the trend, or has this come to be expected? Not at all surprised. Yeah. I mean, you know, look, you can't see Kick and Telegram and XRP <laughs> sued and think that, like, the SEC is changing its position. I mean, there's a funny thing running around crypto Twitter today that somehow the major questions doctrine matters here. And it's like, 1933, Congress granted a major question to the SEC, which is if it's a securities contract in, or investment scheme or whatever, the SEC has full regulatory power over yeah. it. So, you know, that one begs its own question. It's like, look, either it passes the Howey test or it doesn't. If it doesn't pass the Howey test, then it's not a security and the SEC does not have any domain over that asset, right? And so the number one way to not pass the Howey test is don't sell your coin for an investment of money. Yeah, and, you know, the notion, the, the phrase regulation by enforcement has gotten a little overused because, look, that's how administrative <laughs> agencies do act. That's what they're supposed to do. But I think the underlying issue here is we need more than that. We do need enforcement, but we need more than that. What I've argued um, is that, look, we should have the SEC and the CFTC devise a set of rules today that would just apply right now to the platforms as they exist. This is the centralized platforms first, right? We kind of have to focus on those. Then we'll move to DeFi, which has its own set of challenges, as we've said come up with a set of rules today that protect investors because whether it's a security or a commodity, they're kind of the same. And that's a baseline. Let's get that baseline in place and then we can kind of over time figure out some of these classification questions and also figure out how then do we address DeFi platforms that are doing the same things. Right. Uh, like maybe just one other comment here which is I have no problem with enforcement of actual rules. The biggest problem that I have is the retroactive changing of the rules, which has been, which has really been what I felt, where all of a sudden you've got enforcement where there weren't rules to begin with. And so, like, there are, like, but that's... That's how it works. Yep. I yeah. mean, that's well, exactly how it works in all And changing ages. your mind yeah. over time has made it incredibly yeah, difficult really to well. operate. We, we, so. we can go on forever, but we're out of time. <laughs> so uh, let's, let's continue this backstage, maybe. Absolutely. Great. Thank Great. you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.